Well, good evening. This is Think Techs Asia, and we are going to be talking about those most unusual international business risks that your lawyer won't even tell you about. And the reason your lawyer won't tell you about them is probably because he or she doesn't even know about them. And to help us with that discussion and uh, probing down in that conversation is uh, uh, Mr. Grant Newsham, who is in the studio with us. And Grant, nice to have you on the program again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who do not know, Grant is a former State Department diplomat, he's a lawyer, and he is also currently with the Japan Forum for uh, Strategic Studies in Tokyo. Am I, did I get all That's that right? right? Got it right. Okay. Um, let's take the situation, uh, folks, where you have a business or a company and you're going into a different market and you've got a prospective business deal. And uh, the question is, what do, you, what do you really look at? And so, Grant, traditionally there are a couple areas that, that uh, the lawyers and financial people are, are trained to look, to look into. And let's talk about those mm -hmm. first. Uh, maybe you want to use those as, as, as legs of a mm -hmm. tripod or a stool. That's right. Uh, the one way to th look at this, David, is as three risk pillars that any, every business transaction faces, particularly overseas. The first one is legal risk, and people kind of understand that because that's what you know, is, the, is the deal lawful. So, so that's those are the things that you and I learned in law school together a that's, little bit. That's right. If you <laughs> stayed awake for the second year, you would have <laughs> learned those. Right. Um, the the third pillar is what I would call financial risk, and that is can the counterparty, can the other person, do what they say they will financially? Have you protected your company's financial interests in a prospective deal? All right, and so typically in a, in a business deal, we would see that's where the company sends in its platoons of, of uh, accountants or CPAs mm -hmm. to, to analyze the books and so forth. That's right, and then people instinctively understand that because that's what accountants are for. It's what you know, financial officers do. Uh, people know that, and they know what lawyers do. You know, the lawyers go in and they look at the the contracts. They write the contracts. Uh, they you know, you know, try to look, ensure that the firm or the company is protected from a legal perspective. All right, and so what? And, and, and now you got my curiosity up. What's what's the third pillar? Well, you're kind of missing something if you're focusing on the first two, or the the, the first one and the third one, legal okay, and okay. financial. So, so what because, am I missing? Well, you see, you can have, and I'll get to that in just a second, because you can have a deal where the the financial or the, the financial uh, aspects are very safe and sound. Uh, it looks like, and the accountant will verify that, and you can have a deal where the contracts are perfect. You know, there's nothing wrong with the legal, and, and what you're proposing to do is legal. But there's Good. this third thing that's missing, and that is, who are these people? Who are these people? That you're dealing with. Uh, who is it that you are going to go into business with, that you are going to sign a contract with? And the way that I would uh, have uh, sort of coined the phrase for this is you'd look at these people from a, uh, the other party, it could be another company, from a criminal probity and reputational standpoint. One is, are they criminals or inclined to criminal behavior? Do they have probity problems, which means, are they honest? And three, what is their reputation? Is there, and is there some risk to you if you do business with them, risk to your reputation? So what you're what you're really talking about in that that gap between the legal side and the the financial analysis mm -hmm. that is the the due diligence that typically is done in, in any deal that piece that's in the middle is really a form of uh, of what of, of business intel or, or police work or what, what do we call that? One, it's a form of common sense, I think. So it's surprising. <laughs> right. It's surprising how often it doesn't get addressed. Well, that's or, because or it's surprising well. how, uh, um, how 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 often common sense is not too common. Um, the it is ultimately it's I would call it a, it's the you might sort of the, the intelligence business. You you just or you just trying to figure out say who it is that you're dealing with, and one of the problems here uh, is that. The so much is expected of lawyers. Um, okay, I can relate with that. Um, there, and the if, clients expect you to know everything, and well, once you bless it, they're fine. Well, and you hear the expression all the, uh, very often in in business. Well, did uh, well the lawyers looked at it, 
No, it could right, be for right, anything. Okay. The okay. lawyers looked at it. My lawyers have seen this. It's mm -hmm. okay. okay. Now, now, I went to, to law school, and I don't remember learning anything about how to go after criminal probity or reputation risks, these CPR risks. Uh, and I took international business courses. Uh, but it, it's so, you know, imagine that if you say you went out to Honolulu International Airport and you were going to fly to Asia, and you got there and you saw the pilot doing the pre-flight check, walking around under the airplane, under the 747, and he looks, at, he looks up at the engine, and then he looks down at the, the mechanic, and he says, did you check the engine? And the, the mechanics, you hear him say, no, that's, I, I had the lawyers looked at it. I had the lawyers look at but, but you, it. That, this is the equivalent, <laughs> because there is an idea that lawyers know everything. And if you've asked the lawyers, they will take care of this, yet this is not something that they learn, the CPR risk. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you've been following this conversation so far, what we're going to be talking about for the balance of this show is that gap area that the lawyers, the, the financial types, the due diligence types either didn't learn or perhaps under the circumstances couldn't learn and require some, some different skills to get in there. I think that, that's it. It's not that these are... That Lawyers are stupid. I think some are being one, and you. Some people might disagree, but these are intelligent people. I think this, and many of them do understand the general concept of CPR risk, but they don't. They don't generally have the experience to address it effectively, um, and that is a serious problem. So, within this area of CPR risk, are things like uh, corporate espionage, organized crime. Mm -hmm commercial fraud, uh, theft of intellectual property, what other general topics are in there that we, we need to address that we need well, to talk you, about? You've covered the main ones. You know, and if you think of it, the bad things that can happen when you do business with the wrong people, it covers all of that. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, once again, money laundering. If you do a deal, the, you know, say you are going to fund the deal, the other party takes the money and does something else with it. Uh, so it's all the things that an unreliable counterparty, an unreliable uh, partner could do. But, you, and you, but it does also cover those specific things you've described, the organized crime risk, uh, for example, intellectual property theft, uh, counterfeiting, uh, the various problems that can come in a joint venture. All right, well, let's talk about some of the examples that, that uh, perhaps you've run across to kind of flush this out mm -hmm. for, for uh, our audience here and then as we get towards a later segment of the program maybe you can help us with some advice some how to yeah. uh, uh, to avoid these kinds of things but before we get into something like a case study or an example that you've been involved with I guess the the $64 question I want to ask you Grant is how did you how did you step into this bucket uh, it's ultimately, I think, what comes of a liberal arts degree. Uh, really? The, you never know. It's, um, but I did work for the, it was a diplomat for the U.S. State Department and learned some things about gathering information and assessing it. Uh, I did some work as a, a, a lawyer, um, actually doing uh, criminal defense work, believe it or not. And you do get a feel for, how to, for us gathering information, assessing it, uh, figuring out what it means and then articulating a position. Uh, that, that's very useful, but really having a very broad understanding of a, uh, of a country and a society is extremely helpful. Knowing the history, uh, knowing the politics, the economics of it, that can actually be very helpful, especially in weighing the, the, qualitative, or the qualitative aspects of CPR risk. Now, does the CPR risk go up once a business steps out into a third world or an emerging economy? Uh, it does, and some kind, though you find that it, the nature of the risk sometimes varies according to the country. Uh, and one might even suggest that there's plenty of CPR risk in, 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 uh, in the United States. Uh, one might point to Enron as an example. Uh, of sure. really yeah, the, the right, sort of right. just purely criminal behavior, and certainly from a probity standpoint, there's nothing good to be said about it. Or we get somebody like Bernie Madoff. That's right, but and it was done in, but it was done in America, and these are 
uh, it's all CPR risk, but in another country, you very often would find organized crime and gangsters and criminals doing this kind of, uh, kind of work, a kind of thing. Well, let's talk about something that's, that's uh, near and dear to you, because I, I understand there was a time when, when you, worked, uh, you worked with Motorola. Mm -hmm. And uh, Motorola stepped into a, a, a rather ugly mess in, in Turkey some years back, did they not? And uh, what was that all about? Uh, that's right. And Motorola was a, really one of America's most respected com companies run by really honest people. Uh, I make no mistake about that, and, but, and I was in the Asia end, so I had nothing to do with this. Um, but what happened is Motorola was wanted to expand into the Turkish market, into Turkey. Okay, uh, okay. And the easy way to do that, obviously, is to find a partner. And they found a Turkish company called Telsim. Uh, and it was run by a prominent Turkish family with a lot of business interests. Um, it was the country's second largest uh, cellular phone uh, provider, which at the time it was a very small market, but everyone knew it was going to just boom. And uh, as a result, Motorola wanted to get into Turkey, and they linked up with Telsip. And they eventually r reached a deal by, under which Motorola would provide and at the same time finance a lot of equipment uh, and uh, provide other financial assistance to Telsim to close the deal. And the amounts were about one to two billion, or at least one billion and probably closer to two billion dollars at least. Big numbers. Uh, yes, it was a, a lot of money. Uh, and the, in this deal, you can bet the lawyers looked at this thoroughly. They probably had a contract this thick. Uh, the financial people did all the financial uh, reviews and they uh, declared it safe enough. Uh, the operations people can verify that if you did the deal that both sides could, could do what they needed to do to operate uh, cell phone systems. The marketing people looked at it. Uh, and everyone looked at this and they, they cleared this, this deal. And um, they, it almost immediately it broke down. Uh, the counterparty tells him I uh, started to misuse the funds immediately, uh, using it um, to prop up their own banks, uh, to expand their other businesses. They had a conglomerate. And Motorola kind of said, well, what are, you do you know, what are you doing here? And they would have arguments, and then the Telsim would promise not to do it again. Motorola would then provide some more money to help the deal go forward. And it just it went on like that until it, it, it eventually just collapsed. And Motorola ultimately ended up begging the White House for assistance getting their money back. Uh, and it dragged on for a number of years. Um, but the, the, the point, now to get to this, my, my point is they forgot to ask one thing when they did this, this deal. And that was, who is Telsim? And who were we dealing with? Who are these people that own this? They and, if they, and if they had done that, if they had done the, the intel, the background check, what would they have found? You would have found these were definitely people with probity problems. Uh, Meaning honesty and ethical dealings. Yes, that, right. and and I this was you know at the beginning of the the internet era, and actually if you had gone to a Kinko's and got four minute, four dollars worth of computer time and typed in the name, you would have probably said yikes, and so for about four dollars they could have prevented a two billion dollar loss to put it in in the most simple uh, terms. And but there is a there is a something uh, you might refer to as joint venture itis when. A lot of companies go overseas and want to de uh, hook up with a partner. We're going to go to a break in just a moment, Grant. And one of the things that uh, we'll do when we come back is look at some other other mm -hmm. examples of this this third pillar of assessing business risk mm -hmm. that you talked about: uh, the the CPR, the the criminal side, the probity or honesty side, and the reputational mm -hmm. side. And we'll do that when we come back after the break. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Think Tech Asia, and I'll see you on the other side. Aloha, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii, broadcasting live from the Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. We raise public awareness about tech, energy, and globalism in Hawaii. Technology is critical to our state. A vibrant tech sector will give us new prospects in the global marketplace and will offer great careers and make our economy more resilient. Streaming live on Ustream and Spreaker, ThinkTech allows its hosts and guests invaluable opportunities to report important events and discuss important questions. 
and to be heard here in Hawaii and around the world. You can find links to our live streams on thinktechhawaii.com or on our mobile website, m.thinktechhawaii.com. And you can see our archive on YouTube. It's all just a click away. We want to do whatever we can to keep Hawaii relevant, connected, and thriving in the complexity of the 21st century. We hope you will help us in those efforts. Tune in today. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're back. You're watching ThinkTech Asia, and I'm your host, David Day. We're here in the studio with Mr. Grant Newsham, who is with the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, a former diplomat, a lawyer, and we're talking all about the international business risks that your lawyer probably can't prepare you for or maybe doesn't know about. And uh, right, if you just joined the program, right before the break, Grant was talking about this uh, rather outrageous swindle that Motorola found itself in in Turkey uh, because they got hooked up with some unsavory characters. And uh, I guess my, my question to you, Grant, is you were saying that for a $4 of computer time at Kinko's, if if somebody had bothered to check, they would have found out about this this family and Telsim that, that that owned, and they would have realized that hey, this the, the, these are not these are not good people to work with. Did they do not do any of that ahead of time? Uh, they certainly didn't do enough. Uh, I will. They did, however, do a very thorough inquiry of the the company and the family um, after the problems happened. Yes, you, you heard me. after <coughs> after, after it <laughs> happened, um, and you know one, one you know it, it's sad, it's unfortunate, but it does point out, as I said, this often this glaring uh, omission in the necessary risk reviews that a lot of companies do. Well, let's let's take up a kind of another another topic and uh, control room. Could you could you bring up uh, uh, visual number one, if we could, please here, <coughs> Grant? What you're looking at is Two guys in suits uh, doing a, uh, I'm sorry, a gomenesai or bowing. What's this photograph all about? <laughs> it, it is a ritual humiliation. Ritual um, humiliation. That's what I would call it. So it, this is yeah. this is part of the R part of the CPR, the reputational damage? Uh, there, yes. Uh, what, what this picture is, uh, David, is uh, it's in 2004, and it is representatives of Citibank um, who are in Japan apologizing uh, to the Japanese government for having, um, amongst other things, allowed uh, the bank to do business with Japanese organized crime. Now, coming back to your <clears throat> discussion at the beginning, beginning of this program, this, this gap that's there, how do you you know, whether it's in, in Japan or Hong Kong or China you know, or in New York City, what is it in the due diligence that you do to keep some kind of organized crime outside of the deal? Well, you have to do your research. Uh, and particularly this is important for a company like Citibank, you know, too, because they have the money and you have to be careful who you're doing business with. Um, I, once again, as an example of how a, a very respected and you know, prominent and sophisticated company can omit this, this second risk pillar, the CPR, this is a good example because Citibank, of course, has a lot of lawyers. Uh, they've got financial people all over the place, right, right. and yet they miss this. And it, they, it isn't like they missed it by a little, they missed it by a lot. And they, they simply did not... Uh, I think organizationally, uh, do what was necessary to um, fend off or detect these risks or address these risks in advance. Have there been a number of of, uh, of other major Fortune 500 or 100 American companies that that have really gotten into trouble in in doing deals with organized crime? Uh, yes. I mean, in, yeah. in your in your in your work or in your experience. Um, well, this is just one very good example that doesn't take place in, in Asia, it's just west of the Urals, was uh, Forbes magazine's uh, top editor in Moscow some years back was uh, like a Russian-American even, and he was um, incautious apparently in what he dug into and he was murdered. 
so that's an extreme example, of course. Okay. But, but uh, another good example, a very useful example, would be Lehman Brothers Japan, because obviously I was in Japan for a long time. So that's where I would have a few uh, good what, examples. What happened with Lehman Brothers? Um, they uh, sort of got fleeced of three hundred and fifty million dollars. Uh, fleeced? Uh, yes, uh, it's it's long gone. It was. Uh, so, um, it, <coughs> 350 million. Yes. And how did that happen? Uh, what happened is that they were um, offered a deal by some uh, apparently reputable investors who were proposing to uh, refurbish Japanese hospitals and old folks' homes, uh, which given the aging society in Japan, that's certainly a potentially profitable and also a laudable objective. Uh, these were a couple of the companies involved in this deal were listed on Japanese exchanges. Uh, the deal was introduced by uh, really what you would call pedigreed uh, people in the extreme. So wait, wait, wait. Pedigree. Uh, <clears throat> let me see if I understood the English. Pedigree, pedigreed people in the extreme. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. Yes. Uh, control room. Could you put up photograph number four, please, for me? These people, pedigreed people, the, uh, like this? They didn't look like that, but they would certainly be um, of passing familiarity. Uh, this would be the, the lower end of the Yakuza organized crime spectrum. Okay. Uh, the okay. people that uh, Lehman Brothers was dealing with were not. Uh, the, as I say, these were the equivalent of Ivy League graduates. Uh, who had worked for you know, the best company. So very difficult to see, to tell, to uh, know. You wouldn't really have noticed uh, if you uh, if you had been to law school or you were a you know, financial type. It's not something you would pick up. Uh, but who picks that kind of stuff up, Grant? Uh, well, it takes somebody with the, the experience to do it and who, you ha and who spends their time focusing on that. You can either have those people internally or externally. But it does take somebody familiar with uh, the subject. Um, so the, the deal was that Lehman Brothers would lend uh, these investors money and they would then refurbish the okay, okay. Uh, hospitals and the Lehman Brothers would get 20% uh, return, as I recall. And it was just for lending some money for you know, how, how much safer could this be. Uh, you get 20% return. Well, why not do that? Uh, and they um, paid the money. 20% return. Uh, that's right. Oh, it's guaranteed. It's a sure thing. You know, okay, no, okay. No, no, no sweat right, here, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, well, they, so <coughs> Lehman Brothers paid the money, and you're, you know, you're supposed to get repaid it or get your money back. And, well, the first payment comes due, and nothing happens. And basically, uh, it was gone. And they never saw Hyden or hair of it again. Uh, but, and one of the, the see, it's, it's, you know, to, you one wants to say one doesn't want to be too uh, harsh on these companies, on uh, Lehman Brothers, because this is not easy easy stuff to do. Um, and they, to their credit, they actually had a a report done by some outside research done prior to the deal, and uh, apparently it was not done very well. And what that points up is a is a problem that comes in. You know, when companies do try to address this CPR risk. They often don't quite know how to go about it, and they can have some. Uh, uh, well, obviously, Lehman Brothers had some problems because they, but they should have known better, uh, in any event. But they, they, to their credit, they did try to do some research, and they um, apparently didn't get very good research. Let's do a little bit different topic now, but but also related. Um, and uh, control room, let's put up uh, visual number uh, number three, if we could here. Let's talk about the whole topic of industrial espionage or, or intellectual property, mm -hmm. because does that, <coughs> that fall within this CPR area at all? Uh, it, it does. It, it's, you know, it's certainly criminal behavior. Uh, and, and remember that America has an Economic Espionage Act that was passed in 1996 because uh, to recognize just how serious a problem this is and to give a, a legal framework for dealing with it. So certainly in the criminal end, the probity as well, uh, that's where you plug this in. Uh, but it is a huge part of the, of the risk uh, that companies, uh, many companies face. And is this, this type of, you know, the, the 
the Lehman Brothers case that you talked about um, is really a, a commercial fraud type situation. Mm -hmm. they, they really just got fleeced. But in, in terms of the industrial espionage, it, it, it really seems like a natural for all of these, these deals where people jump up and down and they say, you know, the, the way to do business internationally is you need to have a good, strong local partner. And you get yourself set up uh, in, in, a, in a joint mm -hmm. venture. And that's kind of been the, the, the mantra in, in many uh, law school programs, uh, MBA programs, executive MBA programs, is, is that it's, it's the joint venture model that's the one that is, is the one that you need to follow. And uh, what's your reaction to that? Uh, it's a good, it is a, certainly a plausible and a, it's, an, it's an ex very good way to do business in many cases. Um, but as l if you d ignore the CPR risk, the criminal probity reputational risk, then you are playing Russian roulette with about two or three rounds uh, in the, the cylinder. Uh, and you see company after company have problems with that. Um, and it, it goes back many, many years. Uh, it's not a, not a new phenomenon. So you have, uh, I, I guess there have been many, many deals in developing countries. Uh, China comes to mind where you, you, have a, you have an American firm that wants to do, produce some kind of product in China. They set up a joint venture with a Chinese uh, Chinese firm, and lo and behold, in eight months, their intellectual property has been uh, ripped yeah. off, and they have actually basically funded the development of a competitor in the same market. Uh, yes, that's the the only problem one would have talking about that is that you would have so much difficulty choosing between the examples. Uh, it, it's so common. Uh, to happen, and that is uh, some fundamental weaknesses of a lot of the companies that go into China, uh, is that they simply are incautious. And once again, the China market is seen as so hot, so attractive that you simply must be there. Yet, you know, these just cases are just it is rife with uh, companies going in, having a partner. Uh, the partner um, either purloins the the, the know-how, the technology or even in many cases will actually start up parallel business even before the JV gets started. Uh, well known Kimberly Clark was uh, uh, victimized in that way back in the 90s. Uh, so it's, it's nothing new. You know, and, and those types of, of intellectual property theft, uh, commercial espionage, uh, that's not limited to, to, to American firms. I mean, I, 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 I believe the Japanese in the high, one of the high-speed rail situations uh, had their technology uh, borrowed permanently, as, uh, as I recall. Yes, you would think people would, that they would have known better. It was one of the, the main Japanese uh, industrial companies. Uh, just a few years ago, it, uh, it had thought that it was going to get into the Chinese market, struck up a deal with a Chinese partner, and um, they figured that it's a booming market, there's going to be great demand for this company's uh, high-speed railways. So they turned over a huge amount of the uh, technology to the Chinese partner, uh, and also whatever they didn't turn over got taken anyway. And they, so they basically sold the Chinese partner one train. Okay. And, and that was it. They were expecting to sell hundreds of trains, and they sold one. Chinese partner got the technology and went into business for itself. Uh, even other Japanese companies actually actually considered this uh, this uh, this uh, other Japanese company to be pretty stupid in this case. It, by by now, the Japanese have have wised up uh, pretty much, although they still get victimized. But uh, one aspect of the once again the the, in, the industrial espionage uh, that that's worth. Uh, problem that's worth mentioning is to, uh, the Chinese are just the latest at it. Um, in the 60s right, and right, 70s, right. the Japanese were caught trying to steal IBM technology. And then in the 70s or the 80s, uh, the Koreans were stealing from you know, Japanese electronics companies. And then in the 90s, you had the Taiwanese in one well-known case involving a company called Nanya, uh, targeted Samsung and L uh, uh, LG. and went after their technology, they got caught. And then in the early 90s, the Taiwanese were complaining about the Chinese stealing their technology. So it reminds you of that, uh, that famous picture of a, a big fish eating a littler fish, eating a littler fish, <laughs> eating a littler fish. Um, th this has been going on for centuries. And we got our start in the Industrial Revolution stealing English technology. Uh, so it is something that goes on, but it's, it's very hard for companies to know what to do about it. Well, let's do this. 
When we come back after the break, let's let's talk about what what does it take? What what does a company need to to fill this gap to to build this pillar of risk management within 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 the business? And you know, how how do, how do we solve this problem and what to do about it? Mm -hmm. We'll do that after the break. Okay. I think you'll be interested in that, so stay with us. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia in Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Ar on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. We're back. You're watching International Business Risks. Uh, we're talking about those uh, rather unusual risks that perhaps your lawyer won't tell you about or doesn't know about. And the same is true with your financial officers, your CPAs. Uh, and, and the big problems involving unsavory characters, organized crime, commercial fraud, all those kinds of ugly examples. And helping us with that is uh, Mr. Grant Newsham here from the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies uh, in from Tokyo. And Grant is a former uh, State Department diplomat and lawyer. And uh, we've been talking up until this point, Grant, a number of different kinds of problems. And so if you just joined the program, you might want to uh, catch it again or back up a little bit because it's important that you understand, I think, the context that we're talking about. So let's, let's talk about, you know, addressing this problem. You know, let's say you and I have a company and uh, we got to have some kind of framework first and maybe who do we, who do we go after to, to fix this and what do they then look for mm -hmm. kind of situation. Well, that, that is the, the, the key uh, issue here, David, is um, because it's, there's so many cases of this that it's obviously it's a problem and it's fun to, it's interesting to hear about the examples. But the real question, okay, what do I do? Because most businessmen you talk to understand, they say, well, what do I do? Uh, and there's a couple of ways, there's some uh, advice that I would give is that uh, first one has to um, recognize there's a problem. Uh, admit that uh, potentially that this you, is before it happens now that's this right is, this <laughs> it's surprising how often you will hear companies say well we don't have that problem we're not in a dangerous business uh, we don't have a problem with uh, for example organized crime uh, you will often hear people say well I know this guy you know well, we've met these com this company we had a great dinner together these are great guys there's no possible problem but you have to set you have to recognize that this is always a potential risk that needs addressed just the way that you buy insurance for various uh, things that could happen to your company. So that, that's important. So you have to have really the top level commitment uh, to addressing this. If you don't, it, it will rarely be done very well. Uh, then a company needs to set up a, well, they have to take a systematic approach to this. They have to do adequate research. The, the word due diligence is used a lot, but due diligence can mean a lot of things. It can mean, or is it due diligence that they are or are not cannibals? Um, but the, the due diligence <laughs> is really, is this from a CPR standpoint, are they okay? Um, and so you have to have, a, say, a systematic approach. And you either use internal researchers or you use external uh, research uh, researchers to do this. Um, and say so that is a, the, the best way to go about it. Um, additionally, uh, one other thing is you have to give this, this particular role equal status as your lawyers and your finance people. Because uh, most companies will do an assessment of whether or not a deal is sound or not. And they'll ask the lawyers, okay. they'll ask the financial people, but they never ask these people. And very, it's rare that they do, even if they have them. Uh, but you've got to have somebody doing this job who knows what they're doing, uh, who is taken seriously. But most companies do not uh, address this, assess this properly. They will I'm going to ask in a minute, who are those people that can really do this job? Mm -hmm. So think about the answer to that question. Um, but before we get to that, um, you know, one of the things that, that 
I'm sure people in the audience here are, are thinking to themselves, uh, if, if they're watching this, sh this show here in Hawaii, is that, well, this, this fellow, Mr. Newsham, is talking about these, uh, all the examples of these, these big, wealthy companies, multinationals, doing business in different parts of the world. And me, I'm just, I just got a handful of employees, and I'm going to do my first deal in China. Mm -hmm. And so no, no need, no need worry about that. And, um, and so let me back it up just a little bit. Suppose you had the same company here in Hawaii, and they're not even going to do a deal in China. They're just out here in the, in, in the marketplace in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a need for this third pillar right here in the local domestic market? <laughs> and as long as there's human beings involved, there probably is. Uh, not being glib here, but, but certainly, you know, one, you could go to any country, any city, and just read the newspaper, and you will see examples of human misbehavior uh, in a commercial context. Uh, they, though you do have, for, I understand, though, that the pr problem that a small company has, because they've got limited resources, and right, they right. have to, but you do have to provide, I'd say, adequate coverage, uh, just as you do for, you have your legal risks and you pay your lawyer a lot of money, uh, lawyers are not cheap, you pay them a lot of money to handle the legal risk. You have your accountants, make sure the account that that's okay. This, this, the CPR has to be seen as a necessary uh, expense, or, and it should be seen as actually something that um, protects your business, it can allow your uh, business to uh, uh, proceed more safely, and, and, in, uh, and even in areas you other might have turned down. Uh, but you do have to be willing to spend some money to do this. But if you th look, if a, even a small company considers how much they pay you know, their, their legal and financial people, uh, they should be able to put this into context. And once again, you don't have to overdo it. Uh, you, you do have to spend enough, but it doesn't mean you overspend. Okay, and, and I guess the question I need to ask, the kind of the follow-up question for this particular area is, uh, and this is something that I, I I know very little about. Is it is it is it possible without this that a that a Hawaii company could actually end up uh, doing business with organized crime here? Here, yes, um, it, it is. Uh, you, you do have to be careful. You know, is the in any given case is the the is the possibility high? Probably not on average. Uh, but in certain areas, it's certainly a, a possibility. Uh, but you just, it is, it just as when you get married, you have some idea who it is you're doing, you're going to marry. Similarly, if you're doing business with somebody, you should have some idea who it is. And too often, the, the wrong assumptions are made. Uh, and Lehman Brothers Japan is an excellent example of a number of incorrect assumptions. Let's go now to the question I asked you that I inter interrupted myself is, who, who do you, how do you find these people? Who are they that, that can fill this gap between the, the uh, legal analysis and the financial analysis that can do mm -hmm. this, this, type of, this type of work? What do you look for? You know, what you, there, I used to think they were about as common as al alchemists, and there's not many of them around these days. <laughs> um, but it certainly is a, it's a specialty that you, you don't really go to school to get it. It's the result of a, generally the accumulation of a lot of experience uh, that allows you to gather information, assess it, put it into the proper context, and make a recommendation. Uh, the, oddly enough, some of the, well, I, I won't get into the who is bad at it because they would take offense, uh, the kinds of people, but a very good background for this is someone, an investigative reporter. If you think of the skills required, it most closely resembles that. Uh, and these are people with um, a lot Sadly, of we don't have too many of those anymore. It's a, boy, it is a, a breed which appears to be going extinct, I think, to everybody's uh, disadvantage. Um, but but that's, if you think of it, you have someone who knows how to gather available information, uh, make sense of it, and then they say, well, what else do I need to know? And they go out and beat the bushes and they're very well connected, and they're able to get this information and then put together a good story. Uh, similarly, a, a, let's say a bright, inquisitive liberal arts graduate um, can actually be trained very well into this kind, of, uh, this kind of work. We'll be back after the break, and when we come back, I'm going to see if I can get Grant to talk a little bit more about advice to companies and how you block or prevent these types of problems in the field of international risks. Stay with us. I'll see you on the other side of the break.
I'm Jay Fidel. That's Sharon Moriwaki of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. And every Wednesday, we have Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We've been doing it for some time now, and we have some fantastic guests on there, unbelievable guests who give us insight into what is going on in a very complex, sometimes very confusing, sometimes very disappointing <laughs> area of, of progress in the state. So we love doing this. We love meeting them. We love talking to them. We love having their ideas out on the table. So maybe, just maybe, we can all make some sense of what's going on. Sharon, what do you think? Thing. I think that's absolutely correct. We enjoy we enjoy ourselves meeting with all these people and hearing about the energy and the state of clean energy and hopefully we advance clean energy for the state. So it's terrific. Join us. Come okay, join it's us. every Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday is Energy Day. Every energy Wednesday, Wednesday, four to five p.m. Hawaii, the state of clean energy here on Think Tech Hawaii. Energy we'll Wednesday. We'll see you there. We're back. You're watching International Business Risks, things that, uh, things that your lawyer uh, may not know about or won't tell you. Um, uh, I suspect if your lawyer knows about it, they will tell you, though, if they're a good lawyer. And uh, our special guest here is Mr. Grant Newsham with the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies out of Tokyo. And uh, Grant, right before the break, you were kind of giving some general pictures picture of the, the, the types of individuals or the skills that skill set that's really necessary to do this this third pillar, the CPR pillar between uh, looking at the legal side of a transaction and the financial side. And let me go back to the, the whole issue of joint ventures now. Um, you, you know the, there, there was this, this, this famous old expression that you know you, you, you don't want to have uh, partners sleeping in the same bed but having different dreams and uh, uh, but is there a, is there a, is there a problem involving interests in, in the joint venture that, that we haven't talked about so far uh, yes and it's one I, I didn't specifically address it but it's worth uh, considering because one has seen this happen uh, particularly once again China is a good example just because of the, the way the markets develop but it isn't exclusive to China is that you have a situation where the Chinese market is con so attractive, the idea of selling one of something to every Chinese person is, has been alluring people forever. Uh, but it, so what you, you have this rush of ill-considered joint ventures. And the ones I'm, that I, I, not I remember noticing this in the 90s, and even a liberal arts graduate could figure it out, that you had this sense that particularly when uh, telecom companies would go into China, that there was very much a sense that, you know, these Chinese people will always be glad. They're just happy to work in our factories. Um, right. This joint venture partner, you know, he's just glad to have been able to join up with us. And what you could see, and he will always be glad to be doing that, but what you had were these very diverging objectives. And the, too often the Western companies did not understand that these Chinese people wanted to make their own stuff. They wanted to be rivals. And you would have them uh, effectively, after about five to 10 years, suddenly um, well-known American telecommunications companies faced fierce competition from Chinese competitors and whom they had actually helped create. Uh, and I saw this happen firsthand in Korea uh, with a uh, American company getting in with a, a Korean uh, company. I mean, CDMA technology, and the idea was that these were just wonderful manufacturers, and they'll just manufacture forever. Yeah, well, they did for a year or two, and then within about five years, if you typed in Google, you would see that the the, Amer the Western company had lost market share. The other one was now the leading company in the Korean. You know, market. as I'm watching your hands here, I keep hearing the, the the word keeps coming to my mind. I see your two hands up and going like this and going like that. I keep seeing the, the, the word Boeing come up constantly and repetitively <laughs> as you're doing this. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, whether it's Boeing or other American uh, high-tech companies, defense uh, contractors and so forth that, that subcontract out some little insignificant piece and all of a sudden, 10 years down the road, they're not going to be able to, to, to beat out a new company in the, the uh, competitive marketplace that they, they have effectively have created. That's exactly what you're saying, is it not? Uh, that's right. And Boeing is, will be a very interesting case study or lab experiment, effectively, because they have recently 
gone into China in a much bigger way. They've even announced, as all the companies do, we have to be in the Chinese market without anyone really asking why and what are the risks and what are the potential downsides. But they say they're going to be there. Um, it's pretty well known that both from a uh, sort of a Chinese government standpoint, but also a commercial standpoint, that there's huge interest in the U.S. Uh, aerospace and aviation industry. Uh, and that is, um, in fact, jet engines or technology is one of the last uh, real pieces the Chinese have not gotten. But Boeing, uh, one might reasonably argue, has uh, made a gamble here uh, to see if they will be able to get into that market and protect their technology, protect their market position uh, over an extended period. Um, there's, once again, I would not be inclined to bet a whole lot of money on it. Uh, but but certainly right. it's really a very prominent com company, and I wonder if, just how much uh, they have assessed the CPR risks there. Maybe no more than Mitsubishi had for high-speed rail. Uh, it was, um, I th one likes to think they know better because they make ex they make fine airplanes, but, but I just but don't. Mitsubishi know. was an example, mm -hmm. so hopefully they've learned from that. Yeah. Control room, let's put up visual number uh, two, if we could, please here. And um, uh, let's go back to this whole issue of industrial espionage, because I think in our audience, people think of this as really as, a, as kind of a mm -hmm. spy, James Bond uh, type situation. You know, we're going to have this guy come down with these magnetic hooks, break through a glass yeah. ceiling and stay off the floor and pick up this hard drive or this disk, uh, whatever. And I suppose there is some of that, but, but what's your reaction to that? Uh, that is one of the reasons that a lot of companies don't address it properly because they think industrial espionage, James Bond. Uh, we have nothing to do with James Bond, no matter how much we'd like to be like him. Uh, but it's considered so foreign to people's experience that they, they often don't know quite how to deal with it. And yet uh, any, that really particularly high-tech companies, it's that know-how which is their only real asset and they need to do a better job protecting it, particularly when you have uh, in Asia, uh, the Chinese government, the Korean government in particular, uh, well known to be uh, aggressively supporting state-sponsored espionage. The, the U.S. government recently issued a report on that. For example, it happens in Asia as well. The French got caught some years back stealing technology from Texas Instrument. So what a company needs to do is to consider, look at this from... Uh, One minute. Okay, they need to have a proper physical controls in. That's common sense. Okay. Procedural controls. Uh, they need to be very careful with their electronic systems, their computer systems. But the vulnerability is the human network. And they have to make sure that their employees are aware of the risk. If you're out to steal information, actually, one of the toughest targets you, can, you will have is one where people know how you operate. And rather than Tom Cruise breaking in through the roof uh, to steal something, it's more likely to happen at a strip club, uh, say, somewhere in Hong Kong, uh, than it is uh, through guys breaking in and, and taking stuff. Uh, but is that human aspect, which a lot can be done just by a very good awareness campaign. So if you combine the physical, the electronic, and the human, uh, you'd be surprised how tough uh, a nut you can, uh, target you can make. And for goodness sakes, U.S. companies should not give away the game. Um, husband your technology. Don't give right. it out um, without some very strict controls, uh, per performance requirements. Um, but just you've really got to uh, treat that as if you are protecting your children. You know, Grant, this has been an outstanding conversation, and I know I've learned a lot. And ladies and gentlemen, I hope you have as well. And and thank you for for joining us on this program. I look forward to to, to seeing you again. And we're about out of time, so ladies and gentlemen, please have a safe drive home. You've been watching Think Tech Asia, and I'm your host, David Day. Good night. <laughs>